Welcome everyone. My name is Coach Gila and I teach nutrition and cooking here at Maya Note. This is actually my classroom. So we have this kitchen area, I have burners and it's a fantastic class. The girls learn a lot about practical everyday nutrition as well as cooking skills, so I love it. Today the topic is how food has shaped humanity. Uh, and I'm excited to bring to you all that I learned. So here we go. Throughout history, food has done much more than just provide sustenance. It has actually acted as a catalyst for social transformation, family dynamics, societal organization, and development in, for industrial and economic expansion. I'm going to go through all of that today. Food's influence can be seen all around us, not just at the kitchen table, in the dining room, or even in the supermarket. So the food has been an important ingredient in human affairs might seem strange, but it would be far more surprising if that not were the case, because throughout history, every single thing has been fueled by food. Okay, we're going to start with farming. Food's first transformative role was a foundation for entire civilizations with the invention of farming. So according to historians, before farming, people were hunters and gatherers. So they would kill animals, they would eat it, they would pick seeds and berries and nuts from wherever they were living, and then when they exhausted that area, they would move on. So people, number one, they could not have a lot of possessions because every time they moved on to a new location, they had to carry everything with them. Interestingly, they also had to carry, you would imagine, their children. So what ended up happening was, the, they, for the most part, their children were spaced three to four years apart because they didn't have another one until the youngest was able to start walking. I thought that was so interesting. Okay, so farming now means that people did not need to travel to find food. Instead, they began to live in settled communities, and they started growing crops, and they started raising animals. They, what they did was they looked for animals that were easy to control, and they built pens, and they kept them, and they, they ate them. Okay, so now, the staple crops that civilization first began with were barley and wheat in the Near East, millet and rice in Asia, and maize and potatoes in America. So these crops were not simply discovered by chance. So it, it's interesting because when I was first thinking about this, I was thinking that they were in an area, they found something they liked, and then they continued to cultivate it and it grew. So that's not what happened. It's so interesting to me because way back when, they, in, they used whatever technology was available to them then by choosing amazing, what they thought were the best seeds of those crops, and they were able to, it, it's really technology at the time, they were able to do what they had to do to make it the best seed, and then those were the ones they planted. So they only, I read this whole entire thing about corn that is so, so cool. So it, corn used to be one row and was very short. And what they were able to do over time was create what we now have today. Many, many, many rows. And instead of being literally this height, it was about a finger's height, it's now what we know it to be. So, so interesting. Okay, division of labor was now made possible by farming. So what does that mean? So when we first became farming communities all across the world, everyone was a farmer. But what ended up happening was they had surplus food. So once you had surplus food, not, they realized not everyone needed to be a farmer. And this is where division of labor came in, but this is also where social stratification came in. And then there was somebody who, so there was a lot of discussion on how and who became the big man who collected the surplus of food and then gave it out. So what I, what I concluded is that when this began, it was from a place of generosity. There was surplus, a lot of farms, people producing, and there was extra. So someone said, I'll collect the extra. This was very common in all these civilizations. I'll collect the extra, and I'll be in charge of it, and I'll give it to people who now become other professions, right? That you have somebody that's a laborer, someone that's a trader, somebody that starts to work with the animals specifically. This person that collected it and was very generous in sharing it with everyone, that was the very beginning of rich and poor and people that have more and less. Very interesting. Okay, in the 1990s, archeologists largely concluded that farming in the Fertile Crescent began in Jordan and Israel in a region known as the Southern Levant. So this Fertile Crescent is a term used by archeologists to describe the area east of the Mediterranean Sea. So this is where everyone believes farming first developed. 
This fertile crescent had regular rainfall, and it was ideal for growing emmer and einkorn. So it was also really good for raising their herds of grass-eating animals, such as sheep and goats. In nearby Mesopotamia, the soil was very fertile, um, but farming was only possible once irrigation methods were developed later on. The first plants that farmers grew in the Fertile Crescent were very tall, wild grasses, including a very early type of barley and primitive varieties of wheat called emmer and einkorn. So these naturally produced grains and seeds that were very tasty and nourishing. So an interesting side note, what did happen though is the hunter-gatherers were mainly eating animal and a little bit of nuts and seeds. When farming was established, their diet shifted to heavy grains, and that wasn't very good for everybody. There was a lot of um, disease and malnourishment started, so very interesting. Then at a certain point, it evened out, and honestly, I believe still today, we're still figuring it out, um, which is what I teach the girls here, balance and figuring out what to eat. Okay, by 8000 BCE, farmers discovered which grains gave the best yields, and then they selected those for planting. Farmers selected and planted only the best seeds from their last crop. Ultimately, they produced more food than they needed, and that's what I was talking about when they exchanged the, the extra food, the surplus, for various goods that other people were then beginning to start to create. Interestingly, by around 9,000 BCE, that's when they first started storing the grains in the winter. So in the beginning, they were using them as, as they were going, but then they realized we can store them and save them. So that's interesting. Um, we know that when people started uh, planting and farming more, their diet shift, shifts, and grains became central to their diet. But for the most part, settling down in areas and staying there instead of moving around provided opportunity. So plants at, could be improved. They selected the best fruits and grains, and then they started saving the seeds, like I said. Plants, this is the interesting thing that is so amazing to me, because now when we talk about technology, we're referring to smart birds, smart boards, iPads, phones that we can do everything with. But back then, in the beginning, beginning, they were literally hybridizing by hands, cross-pollinating to create new, stronger forms. Fascinating. Fascinating that they were able to do that then, that they thought to do it, that they figured out how to do it, and that it actually worked. Okay. So, so this settlement also appears, the time when they began actually having cities and settlements was when they started child care and division of labor between the genders. Because when you were hunting and gathering, you couldn't stop what you were doing. So everybody was pretty much doing the same thing, right? It was an, uh, it was, it, you cannot interrupt yourself. We're on the hunt, you don't just stop and say, oh, I'm gonna feed the baby now. But once they were settled, it was the men that were farming, and the women that were now able to interrupt whatever it was that they were doing, canning and trying to preserve their food and um, taking care of the little vegetable patch, be able to stop and take care of the kids. Okay. Having provided this platform on which civilizations could be founded, food subsequently acted as a tool of social organization by helping to shape and structure the complex societies that then emerged. So the political, economic, and religious structures of ancient societies, from hunter-gatherers to the first civilizations, were based upon these systems of food production and distribution. Okay, the next part, uh, so I teach cooking, for here in school and everywhere, and when I started reading about the spices, I was intrigued. So here we go. Europeans' tastes and need and desire for spices for their food led them to begin exploring the entire planet, and it, they wanted direct access to these resources. So of course, this led to the discovery of new lands, as well as vast international trade networks through which knowledge and culture spread. Unfortunately, it did also help to spread disease, such as the Black Plague, the Black Death in the 14th century. Okay, so what are spices? They were expensive imported goods, and they were so special back in the day, they were presented as gifts to other people. They were also bequeathed to their family and their wills, along with other valuable items. Okay, so in Europe, the Greeks seem to have pioneered the culinary use of spices, with the Romans borrowing and then popularizing this Greek idea of using spices to enhance their food. The, um, I was very into the cookbooks that I found from all over history. So the cookbook of Abacus, it's a compilation of 478 Roman recipes. I think that's incredible that there are so many. 
calls for generous quantities of foreign spices including pepper, ginger, puchkuk, which is kosiyas, which I still don't know what that is, malabathrum, and turmeric. Some I recognize and some I don't. In medieval, in medieval cookbooks, spices appear to be in at least half of the recipes, which is so interesting to me because even once they were known, they weren't used in every single recipe. It was about half at the time. Meat and fish were served with richly spiced sauces, including a variation of cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, pepper, and mace. So reading this in, 19, in 2018, almost 2019, it was so interesting for me to recognize the spices that they were super excited about back in Roman and medieval times. By the first century BCE, as many as, as, many as 120 ships were sent every single year to India to buy spices, including this black pepper, costas, and nard, along with gems, silk, and other exotic animals. Spices also crossed the world by land. From the second century BCE, overland routes connected China with the Eastern Mediterranean, and spices also traveled by land between North and South India, between India and China, and between Southeast Asia and inland China. A Roman cookbook, another cookbook, from the fifth century called The Excerpts of Vinadarius, lists more than 50 herbs, spices and plants, extracts, under the heading, this is the part that I thought was super cool, it was called Summary of Spices, which should be in the house in order that nothing is lacking in seasoning. 50, right? That's kind of a lot. I don't know. I don't think I have that many, and I have quite an extensive collection of spices. So what did he include? Pepper. Pepper was big then. I mean, who? I'm not even such a big pepper fan. No, right? Anyone? Pepper? I use it. I use it sparingly. Not so much. It, it was the biggest deal back then. So they used pepper, ginger, costas, spikenard, cinnamon leaf, and cloves. Okay. You don't hear salt in this. Is this not? So salt right? comes. Salt comes. Salt was used for preserving. Right. That was their method of preservation, which becomes a big, big problem, which we're going to get to, in the wars. The, which I never thought I had any interest in until I did research for this, and I got really into the food and war part. We'll get to it. The pursuit of spices in an, is another way in which food affected the history of the world, because spices were not the only things that flowed back and forth along these trade routes. New inventions, languages, artistic styles, special customs, and religious beliefs also traveled back and forth along these trade routes. Knowledge of wine and wine making traveled from the Near East to China, and knowledge of noodles, how interesting, traveled back in the other direction. Other ideas soon followed, including paper, the magnetic compass, and gunpowder. So this is how everything came from one place to the other. Traders and geographers depended on each other. Traders needed maps, and map makers needed information. So this is also why much of our information about spices from way back when comes from early geographers. So spices led to the first global trade networks. The great spice-seeking voyages revealed the true geography of the planet. European powers around the world also started setting up trading posts and colonies in all of these locations. So along with, the, after the spices now, the next biggest thing was coffee, tea, cocoa, chocolate. And what do we need for that? Sugar. So here comes sugar, steps into the scene. As well as being notable for its reliance on slavery and its economic importance, sugar production also created a new model for industrial organization. What does that mean? Making sugar involved a, a series of processes. They needed to cut the sugar cane, press the sugar cane to extract the juice. They had to boil it, and they skimmed the juice. Then they had to allow it to cool so the sugar crystals can form. Then they used this leftover molasses and they turned it into rum. So each step of the way, they had to develop machinery to make it cost effective and useful because they had slaves doing it. And what they figured out was that it was much easier for them if they had people in each uh, section of the, um, thinking of a line, like a, a line, assembly line, assembly line. So they, what they did was they created specialists. Specialists here, specialists there, specialists there. It was much smarter than having one person learning how to do everything. So that idea began here, as well as the machinery that was used to develop sugar and process sugar. At the time, it was powered by wind, water, or animal power, but it was the most elaborate and costly industrial technology of the time, and it prefigured the equipment that was later used in the textile, steel, and paper industries. Okay, now let's get to war. 
I just wanted to add a note about that, that in a way, this issue of slavery and sugar is a cycle because um, they found that indentured servants weren't as useful, which they had a lot of because they would leave after a while and they would have to start training a whole new group. So um, slavery became an essential part of the um, yes. of, of creating these sugar plants. To add to that, the work was deathly. I mean, you could die so right. easily. That was the That's evidence. why the indentured servants weren't sticking around. Right. Mm -hmm. Each step of the process was extremely dangerous. So you couldn't get people to do it voluntarily. Yes? Sugar beets, was, when was that? So around here. So after they figured out how to what to do with it, that's when they started the whole um, sugar sugar colonies and farms, and that's when sugar they started growing. Yeah, sugar Yeah, sugar canes. Yeah. yeah, but I'm talking about sugar beet. I don't know. I have to look that up because that's what. They Stay after. I'll look it up. <laughs> I'll discuss okay. it with you. Um, okay, let's talk about war. Food. Yeah. So the use of food as a weapon of war is timeless. When I first started researching this, I was surprised and not surprised at the same time. I know that when my family leaves the house for a, I don't know, an hour or two excursion, I have five kids, the first thing I say is, did I ever take snack, take water, what do you do? Well, depending on the time of day, do we have lunch packed? Are we going to be back for dinner? It's just the first thing I think of. Um, and no one told me to think that way. It's just how I think. So when I started reading all about food and war, I was thinking about it through my own lens, and I was astonished that this is really what happened. So let's talk about it. The most effective weapon of war is starvation because armies were marching. So not only did you have to feed the people to keep the soldiers, to keep them with energy to march, but they had to have fodder for the animals as well. So generals who weren't able to cope with the logistics of feeding their armies sometimes didn't even get to the battlefield to fight the fight. Throughout history, siege warfare was used as well. During the first Beit HaMikdash on the Sarbatevet, Nebuchadnezzar came upon Yerushalayim. He encamped upon it, built forts around it. And the city came under siege. And it was an intense, intense famine. People had no bread. The city was, it was terrible. And we know what happened. This led to the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. During the second Beit HaMikdash, the siege of Masada was one of the final events in the first Jewish-Roman war. World War II's siege of Leningrad stands as a very chilling reminder of the toll a military blockade can have on civilian population. The three million inhabitants of Leningrad had been caught completely unprepared, and they lacked sufficient supplies for this prolonged standoff. In addition to the daily bombardments by the Luftwaffe, they were soon forced to contend with extreme hunger, freezing temperatures, and disease. People ate everything from wallpaper paste to shoe leather, to supplement their meager rations, and some of them even resorted to cannibalism. Despite these horrific circumstances, the citizens of Leningrad managed to endure life under siege for 872 days, from September 1941 until January 1944. But even in victory, the siege proved very tragic. By the time the city was finally freed by the Red Army, an estimated one million Soviets, most of them civilians, had perished. Food played a tremendous role in determining the outcome of two wars that defined us here today in the United States of America, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. So as Tom Standish writes in his book called An Edible History of Humanity, he writes, in theory, the British should have easily been able to put down the rebellion among American colonists. Britain was the greatest military and naval power of its day, presiding over a vast empire. In practice, however, an army of supplying this army of tens of thousands of men operating some 3,000 miles away post, po, um, posed enormous difficulties. And the British failure to have adequate food supplies to its troops was not the definitive cause of defeat, but it certainly was a significant reason for it. The colonists had the advantage of being on familiar territory and had the support of local farmers as they traveled. I thought that very interesting to note that in addition to their rations, they were given vinegar. So they were told to use this vinegar to make the water from nearby creeks, rivers, and lakes more potable and added flavor to the vinegar. Vinegar's antiseptic properties were also told, they told the soldiers that they were beneficial. 
So today, in 2018, almost 2019, there's a huge push for us to be drinking apple cider vinegar daily for its many health benefits. So interesting. Okay, so what did people eat during this time? 18th century cooks served only what was in season. Fresh fruits and vegetables were not available year-round, so they ate what they had available. The, the Virginians could, pres they did, back to the salt, they did start preserving foods now using smoking or salting methods. Now, if they wanted chicken for dinner, they had to go in the morning and, and shoot the bird. They had to pluck it, clean it, cook it. While they did eat leftovers for supper and breakfast before it could spoil, the English nobility didn't do that. They had kitchen staffs filled with specialists. Um, at one point, King George II had over 200 cooks. Wow. Cooking and baking required the ability to use a wood fire, gauging and using wood heat accurately and carefully. I tried to do that in camp. Not so easy because there's no temperature control. You really have to know what you're doing in practice and figure it out. Cooks approach seasoning very differently than we do today. Um, they used a lot of grease, a lot of meat, a lot of seasoning. It was very, very heavy, even a lot of sweetener. They considered animal organs like hearts and brains delicacies. We do know now that they are good for you. So maybe they knew what they were, they just knew intuitively that it was good for them as well. Uh, cooks used cinnamon, nutmeg, and sugar very liberally. They did not like eating raw fruits and vegetables. They cooked everything. And they liked sweet drinks. So dry wines were not popular at all. Cocktails did not exist, but very alcohol-rich punches did exist. Their main meal dinner was served in the middle of the afternoon, and formal meals had two or three courses. Meat dishes often came to the table with the animal's head and feet still attached. That would not fly today. Um, yeah, the upper class, interesting, the upper class ate very little bread. They, instead, they might just use a little roll or a piece of bread to sop up some gravy, but they didn't eat it in abundance. Aspiring cooks for the upper class in both America and England learned look to France for elegant meal ideas. Menus relied heavily on sauces, and dishes required multiple steps to prepare them. People in lower society liked simple food, and this explains why the period's most popular cookbook was written by a woman named Tana Glass. It's called The Art of Cooking Made Plain and Easy for Housewives and Maids, and it was published in 1745. In the Civil War, food played a very powerful role in determining the outcome. The South was steadily starved by the Union's naval blockade of the Atlantic coast and the Mississippi River, which cut off vital supplies of grain, pork, and lethally salt. The North was still able to trade with Europe. While parts of the South were close to famine, the North continued to dine well and even exported surplus food. Soldiers in the Civil War were given a hard, unsavory, cracker-like biscuit called hardtack. Hardtack, it's bread, but it's super hard, and it's three inches long, about half an inch thick, and the, what they would do is they would dunk it in either water or coffee or soup to make it palatable and edible. During Sherman's march from Atlanta to the sea, Union soldiers feasted on cattle and hog and vegetables and fruit, but what they did was they destroyed whatever they couldn't carry with them. So looking into the cookbooks of the time clearly illustrated people's hardships. Only one cookbook was published in the South during the Civil War, and it had recipes for apple pie without apple. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how in a minute. They also were teaching people in these cookbooks how to cure bacon without salt. So this cookbook was called The Confederate Receipt Book, published in 1863. It had a very revealing subtitle. This is what it was called. A compilation over, of over 100 receipts, uh, recipes, adapted to the time. And they were terrible times. So miserably manifested in this recipe. This is the recipe. You ready? To one small bowl of crackers that have been soaked until no hard parts remain, add one teaspoon of tartaric acid. To sweeten to your taste, add a little butter, add a little nutmeg. That was their apple pie. Yeah. While the North was affected by the war, Northern cookbooks published during this time continued to call for exotic foreign ingredients like spices, cayenne, pineapple, chocolate. They had dishes in these cookbooks at the time called Calcutta curry, mulligatawny soup, and various soufflés. The most serious result of the blockade was the lack of salt, which the South imported from Wales. Fish, meat, butter, and other food could not be preserved without salt and spoiled quickly in the heat. The army ran out of provisions on the home front, uh, provisions, and the home front grew hungry too. 
salt salmon was so severe that andrew f smith wrote in starving the south how the north won the civil war this is what he wrote southern newspapers journals and book and books published dozens of recipes made with little salt eating tinned corned beef which did not need table salt was encouraged and those living near the coast began to cook their rice grits and hominy and so in seawater as the war came to its end america got its first cookbook solely dedicated to leftovers okay so when i teach my workshops locally the most requested workshop is i don't want to be cooking every day all day how do i do this simply and quickly so this book was published in 1865 it's called what to do with a cold mutton a book of rochelle together with many other approved recipes for the kitchen of a gentleman of moderate income it was published in 1865 and was very very well received hundreds of northern families had lost their husbands sons fathers in many cases they had lost their basis of their economic subsistence so as many americans knew all too well turning the scraps of one leftover dinner into another palatable meal the next day could mean the difference between living on one's budget and sliding into debt so i'm just keeping track of the time uh, after World War II, the United States entered into a new modern age of technological invention that profoundly changed the way Americans cooked and ate. Through popular media, especially women's magazines, and the new medium of television, advertisers encouraged women to use technology to create the ideal home. Technology promised women freedom of drudgery. Right? We, we all know now what really happened, but it's so interesting to look at it back through their eyes. So appliance manufacturers, trades associations, food product companies, they all published dozens of cooking booklets in post-World War II period to promote their products. They shared a common goal to market this modern aspirational lifestyle in which the kitchen was a woman's domain. At the same time, they trained women to adopt a new style of cooking. Now let's talk about canned food. Canned food as a commercial product dates all the way back to the 19th century. Van Camp, one of the earliest canned food manufacturers, is actually still in operation today, started in 1861 and supplied canned beans to the Union Army within the they had military contracts. Returning vet, vet, veterans brought back a taste for this canned product as well as an appreciation for the convenience of it. Between 1948 and 1958, the number of supermarkets in the United States doubled to over 2,500, with most of the expansion occurring outside central cities. Supermarkets anchored this new post-war housing model. After World War II, planned communities sprang up all across the country. Levittown on Long Island in 1947 was the first of many, marketed towards veterans eligible for a low-interest government-backed mortgages. Tens of thousands of these families moved into the suburbs. Now, these new suburban homes were constructed with the latest in modern technology, including this all-electric kitchen. The modern 1950s kitchen included an electric range, fridge, refrigerator freezer, dishwasher, and dryer, and an assortment of small appliances like skillets and blenders and mixers. Consumers could even buy a microwave in the 1950s. It was available. They did not buy it because it was very expensive, but that's when it first came out. Many of these appliances, interestingly, were sold with cookbooks to teach people how to use them using these new appliances. A housewife born in 1925 and living in a suburban home in 1950 did not grow up surrounded by this electronic technology. Her mother may have had a refrigerator, certainly didn't have a freezer with a separate door. And she didn't have all these appliances sitting on top of her counter. Post-war economic prosperity encouraged people to buy more food, processed foods came easily, and you could quickly assemble a meal using them. Grocery bills went up as women happily purchased more and more of these convenience foods. Food company marketing materials assured women that their products were both high in quality and health. Now, now is when products like Tupperware, Saran Wrap, all these other things came out to help you store your leftovers and keep them help, um, fresh. Okay, at the beginning of the century, when women were cooking meals from scratch, sewing their own clothing, washing their sheets and towels by hand, and buying fresh food from the market daily, it took literally a team of people to run the household. But by the 1950s, it could be done by one person. But did women, were women happy doing this all day, right? What happened? 
lifestyle marketing began to recognize that women found being a housewife somewhat less than fulfilling. There was this gradual transition from characterizing the ideal woman as a housewife to hostess. That became the new word, hostess. This was very evident in the increasing number of recipes found during this time in cookbooks <clears throat> for party food, party planning tips, and even more specialized serving pieces that you can now purchase that now became available for sale. Some women took advantage of this increased free time by enrolling their children in activities like sports and scouts, ferrying them back and forth to these activities. Many women joined clubs and organizations, and there was an increased number in married women taking jobs, even if they were part-time at the time. Now, even though marketing touted the kitchen as a woman's special domain, technology gradually reduced the amount of time she needed to spend there. A 2016 study found that nearly 60% of calories consumed in the modern in modern America comes from processed foods. While the flavors and packaging have evolved with contemporary tastes, processed and packaged foods remain household staples. Now, I just want to comment that that doesn't necessarily mean they're unhealthy. You can have guacamole packaged, that's healthy. There are plenty of healthy processed foods. Just like in the 1950s, technology today has given women many, many more choices as to where and how to spend their time. And no longer does the kitchen represent this aspirational ideal of womanhood. In fact, when I teach my workshops, it's how to spend less time in the kitchen, serve some beautiful, delicious, nourishing meal, but not be in there all day. We all have things to do. Contemporary women spend less, much less time on household chores, into, including cooking, than their mid-century counterparts. So today, while we are still um, inundated with new technology, new appliances, I mean, I, had, I just bought an Instant Pot in the last year, I have an air fryer, um, there are now smart appliances. A friend of mine got an oven that texts her when her food is ready on her watch, I, on her Apple Watch. I know, I don't have that. Um, the, so even though we have all these new modern inventions going on, there is a farm-to-table pushback approach that's going on. So what is what does that mean? So there's this push to buy local, in-season food, um, even to know your farmer. So I don't know my farmer, but I do try to take my kids once a year to pick fruits and vegetables. I think it's really cool for them to actually see for the brachot, like when you make a brachot, whether it's ha'etz or ha'adama, like where it comes from. Um, and it's nice for them to pick vegetables and see the farm and see how it grows. So I do do that personally. I do have friends that live in Rockland County that do know their farmers, that they buy their eggs from, their fruits and vegetables. They have a relationship with them. Here locally, I know I have a lot of friends that purchase their fruits and vegetables through a CSA, a Community Supported Agriculture Group. Now, I would do that. However, because I'm very into it, I go up to Missouri. I work in camp for seven weeks. So the season, no one will be here to receive it. So it doesn't make sense for me. But if you haven't heard of it, look into it. It's super cool. Basically what it means is that these farms offer a certain number of shares to the public, and you purchase a share. It's like having a membership to this farm. And every week they deliver a box of produce. And you never know exactly what you're going to get, which, which makes it fun and interesting, because then you can start to learn new recipes for whatever comes in your box. Traditional eating habits are changing in many ways. We know that. Studies have shown that today people all over the world spend less time eating at home, and even those meals that are eaten at home aren't necessarily home cooked. The shift towards eating food away from home has created a movement that focuses on fast food and chain restaurants. This, in turn, created a movement to combat growing obesity. So, I didn't write about this, but I could talk to you for a minute because I have a little extra time, that when processed food came out and people started eating it, the obesity epidemic rose, especially in children. So in 1972, there was a McGovern report that came out saying that we should stop eating saturated fat. And they were blaming the obesity epidemic on fat. And the companies that sold fat, animals, butter, dairy industry, they went crazy, and they lobbied, and they got the government to retract the McGovern report. Yes. In 2002, it happened again. There were senators that now switched from, from fat to sugar, and they were trying to say 
that sugar is causing an obesity epidemic in adults and children. And they actually had a report written about this. And what do you think happens? The sugar industry lobbied, and they got it removed. If you look at it, if anyone has any, I didn't plan to talk about this, so I didn't bring it, but if you look at any processed anything, a box of cereal, crackers, anything, the nutrition, the daily information is listed there except for sugar, except for sugar. And then with Michelle, Michelle Obama, when she first started talking about her health movement, she included food uh, to change the food, to change marketing towards kids. But guess what happened? The sugar industry spoke up again. And what did her movement turn into? Move more. Let's move. Which is fantastic. And kids need to move more. But today, we are, the, the industry in general is consuming way too much sugar. And if you were to look at any a product, you won't even know it because it doesn't say the percentage. So when I, sh I we just finished a sugar unit here. My class here, we started off with a how to eat, create a balanced plate unit. Then we went into a healthy habits unit. And we discussed healthy habits. And each student had to choose something, discuss why they think it's important for us all to incorporate into our daily life, and then how we should incorporate it into our daily life. And then for our sugar unit, I showed my students a movie by Dr. Mark Hyman, it's a documentary, about eating too much sugar. And at the very end of the movie, there's a call to action. And my students took it very seriously. And they want to now teach the rest of the school and the community all about, there is a safe threshold for sugar, and they know it, but what happens when you consume too much? So I'm not sure where we're going to go with it, but we're going to try to do something. But also, the, the parallel thing is the corn syrup is like mm -hmm. a substitute, although it's not sugar. You know, if you're looking on a list, an alphabetical list, corn syrup kind of rye, I think, is even used so more heavily. You're bringing up what is exactly the problem, that there are many words for sugar that is not sugar, and one does not necessarily know that unless they know it. So you know that corn syrup is sugar. But if you don't know that, you don't know it. And you can be eating a food that is, looks healthy, you think it's healthy, and it doesn't even have to be cake candy ice cream. It could be crackers, cereal, marinara sauce, yogurt. It could be a dozen foods that appear to be healthy, but they have this added sugar in it or corn syrup. Um, anything, just FYI, that ends in O-S-E is a sugar. Maltose, dextrose. Uh, fructose, anything that ends in OSE is a form of sugar. We have friends who would buy kosher for Passover soda because they thought that that was, you know, they felt that that was healthier than the <laughs> corn syrup one that you, you get. Um, that, yes, and that is why I teach this class because one does not know unless they learn. And it's fantastic because my students are learning and I love teaching them. Um, so my final statement as we're about to end, while processed foods are certainly convenient, there has been a push to increase consumption of whole foods, especially fruits and vegetables. And whether you choose to eat processed foods or only foods in their natural states, I believe that food is going to be a vital ingredient for our future. Mm -hmm.